You're listening to the Black Lodge Games Podcast. We are back after a short delay due to life, circumstances, and the wage cage. Today, we're going to be talking about alignment. Sure, this topic was beaten to death on Twitter and everywhere else, but we didn't get to participate. So now it's time. So, Nick, why don't you start us off and tell us what is alignment? Should you have it in your game? Uh, is Watsy making the right decision for once in, in getting rid of alignment? Or are they once again tripping over themselves? Uh, once again, they are definitely uh, making the wrong choice. The worst of all possible choices in removing alignment. Now, alignment is it's one of those things that uh, comes around again and again. People have very strong opinions about it, which I suppose makes sense given what it is. You know, we're talking about the moral framework of an entire world and how your character is defined. Um, and, you know, I believe both of our opinions early on in our gaming career uh, were fairly similar in that, um, and I think this is the case for most people still to this this day, in that um, alignment is, you know, an unnecessary um, remnant of a bygone age. Mm -hmm. um, at best, it serves a purpose to, um, you know, throw throw a lifesaver to poor role players to give them something, anything to hang their character concept on and be a, you know, a uh, a counterbalance to 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 trash a trash immersion and trash role playing or you know as i said at at worst it's a complete afterthought that's only given any word count in later editions of any game um just because of the momentum of of history it was there from the beginning and so it you know it kind of has to be there even though it's not implemented it's not really integrated into any setting it's not uh there's no um, explanation in more than a lip service fashion as to how to actually role play that for your character. Or um, why you would role play it. Or why. Um, and we would argue that the, the alignment system as it's implemented in D&D, &D, in Pathfinder, um, you know, it is it, it is a terrible system. Uh, not because the idea of it, however, is lacking in quality or merit, but the work uh, just hasn't gone in. The thought hasn't gone in to actually take it to its logical conclusions and make make it meaningful and impactful, either to the GM in um, portraying the larger world and the NPCs there, or for a player, um, you know, how to guide and, and bring about their their role play. Um, you know, you and I yeah. were having this this conversation. Um, you know, your alignment, in whichever fashion it's um, you know, conceptualized, law versus chaos, um, order versus dis disorder, good, evil. Uh, any combination you know, the, the, thereof, yeah. Any combination thereof. Um, you think about yourself as a person in living in a world um you know these these implicit virtues or value systems they really are a tremendous foundation to how you present yourself in the world how you see yourself how you see other people how you navigate the world the choices that you make um again not in an usually um in an explicit way yeah it's not um, something that like i'm consciously thinking about you know whether i am lawful or chaotic or good or evil on a daily basis right. but it's just an implicit part of my worldview there is some component yeah. of my orientation toward the world yeah this is one of those it's like a butterfly effect situation these are you know the wide low waves that really shape a huge portion of the current of people and a civilization and so you know i think we we have a lot of different different examples and i think that's you know a preamble on on my part i know you have been um thinking a lot and rereading a lot on um 
a game we've talked many times uh, before, but yeah. Empire and its different uh, iterations, particularly Requiem, I think for for case a um, a system of sort of morality or alignment that is really done done very well. Very well. Yeah, I mean, I think the the biggest problem with alignment as it's used in a lot of products is that it's not used. Um, I mean, there's right. no, it's kind of tacked on as an afterthought now. Um, and is, there's no, there's nothing really tying it to kind of the, the cosmology or metaphysics of whatever world you're playing in, um, which if you do that makes the game a lot more interesting. Um, like I looked at the uh, first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, first thing I did was go and look up what Gygax had to say about alignment. And uh, it was interesting because the way what he said, you know, it's it's basically it's like your kind of alignment with your your alignment. I can't believe I just said I used the word I was uh, trying to define. Uh, <laughs> it's a nice little circle <laughs> that we got there. I uh, know, but it's your, it's yeah. your orientation towards a, a part of the kind of cosmology of the world. Even it, it doesn't matter like however you are acting, you are acting in service of some deity in D anD. d whether you are mm. aware of it or not, your actions are acting in service of those deities. Um, and so I like the idea of having, uh, you know, I, I like the versions of D&D and games like Lion and Dragon that have the single axis of law versus chaos, uh, which, as you can see, our mid-journey created background here is wonderfully mm-hmm. interpreted <laughs> My my three-word prompt. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's... Uh, it's not simply an afterthought in, in a lot of those games, which is why it ends up being pretty cool to me. Like in Lion and Dragon, for instance, which is my current obsession, and I will get to Vampire in a moment, um, Law and Chaos are kind of like locked in this, it's not even a metaphysical battle, so to speak, but uh, they're locked in opposition to one another. And as you get um, more, like the the unraveling of civilization, boils out and manifests itself as more monsters showing up in the world, you know? Uh, So when you're looking at it like a period of like English history, like the Rose War, the political instability uh, and the the social fabric disintegrating starts essentially boiling out into the rest of reality. And you get, you know, more incursions by elves and goblins. And uh, there's more uh, like cults of chaos springing up across the land and there's no coordinated conspiracy or anything there it's literally it's like this philosophical metaphysical force within the game um and they have literal implications there as well i mean on the on the side of law like the church has like these objective miracles of the clerics you know these are these are literally like the power the divine power of the unconquered son and, and law and order and then on the chaotic side you have the kind of dark mysteries of magic, all of which are very real, objectively real within the world. It's not simply like a a made up ethical code. It's not a subjective um, choice. It's not a tacked on game aid. Yeah, exactly. It's something that bleeds into it's it's part of the physics. Yeah, exactly. So a, to say, of the world. It's it's embedded in like the fabric of the reality of the world, and that is awesome and the way in which your characters in in a setting like that when your characters are aligned you know with either side of this kind of spectrum and it doesn't again it doesn't necessarily mean good or evil you can have people who are lawful who are cruel and chaotic who are benevolent and 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 all of that um without needing to account for a good and evil axis um but it does it 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 contributes to the churning of that world you know and that is there's i think maybe like three paragraphs in lion and dragon about alignment like that's it but the rest mm-hmm. of it is implicit in the setting and then when you get the uh you know the the source books it's very much explicit about law and chaos um but again it's not right. even specifically talking about character alignment um and so if you have a world that functions that way where the world building has this built in it gives you a lot more to kind of work with with your role play and getting rid of alignment is you know like watsi is doing to me it seems more like a really just a symptom of 
the philosophy of the age that we live in. Yeah. It's like this total nihilism of like discarding any notion of categorizing the world. Any value system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any hierarchy, any, yeah, any categorization. It's a uh, creative bankruptcy and moral, moral nihilism. Exactly. And, and that's, uh, that's going to make for a shitty game. You know, a game that yeah, has I mean, no sense of right or wrong, even even if your protagonists are ostensibly on the wrong side, you know, it's like right. there is a side though, <laughs> and and right, you're on, you're only taking away from your game. You're carving out pounds of flesh from what could and should be a robust, interesting, engaging right. world with interesting, immersive, engaging characters. You're stripping um, paint off of the canvas. You're bringing yes, it back yes. to a blank canvas where you have no limitations, nothing, you know, and that's not a good thing. That is really not a good thing. You're not, you know, you know the, the, you know, the, the argument that I think would be, you know, they would use among other things uh, is um, we're not confining people. You know, this is, mm -hmm. we've talked about this before, you know, uh, you know, rules confinement equals bad. Yeah. That's 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 wrong. Yeah, you're not it's so dumb. <laughs> you're not giving greater freedom to explore morality uh, or explore, um, you know, um, emotional um, conflict or conviction. You're removing the possibility to really do that in any meaningful way. Yeah. You're removing a limb. You're you know exactly. You know, uh, you know, giving it more range, you know, range of movement. You're just, you know, you're amputating that limb. That whole thing is is gone, right? Um, you know, which is is terrible, and that's that's that that's been the trend, I think. Yeah. Um, in larger pop culture, in general, is to just water it down. You know, throw throw paint thinner and, and turpentine right. over the masterpiece. You know, and just let's get back to that you know, that gray, gruel blank canvas yeah. where anything goes and nothing matters yeah i i completely agree and the uh the thing is when games i don't think i've really come across many games that don't have alignment you know in in the sense that like even if you have if you get rid of the terminology of alignment you're not talking about right. law chaos good and evil most mm -hmm. games still end up having some either moral component or some sort of something that is a, a giving you a direction for characters. Yeah. You know, it is, it is essentially, it's the same. It is the same mechanic. It's just in a, in a different form um, or not mechanic perhaps, but it's the same concept that's being presented in a different form. Um, right. But I think basically uh, what that does is just to get like giving your characters an orientation, you know, uh, like a, a direction, a kind of prime direction that they're always uh, kind of moving in. Right. And that can change. And that's the other thing is like this whole thing of like you're being confined by alignment. Uh, that was never even a thing in D&D. &D. Like your characters could change yeah. alignment based on their, you know, the DM is supposed to be keeping secretly keeping track of all your actions. You know, that might change yeah. your alignment. And then your alignment changes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. And that can have serious That's, consequences if you're, you know, a paladin or, you know. <laughs> right. Or a cleric of a particular right. deity. But, you know, again, this is, you know, evidence of just more, uh, more trash play. You know, people read, oh, this, you know, this am rule, you know, <laughs> you know me need maintain rule. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, uh, you know, me lose game. Yeah. You know, you're. You just have no creativity at right. all to uh, to uh, embody a character or as a, as a GM to challenge and to have things naturally um, adapt and flow and and happen as a natural consequence of people changing, especially you know someone at you know, again to keep with the the sort of D and D example, you know, someone at mm -hmm. first level, presumably somebody very young. Um, in actual age, mm -hmm. um, who is just getting started in whatever their career, their quote unquote class, whatever it is, their, you know, their experience in the larger world and these deadly, um, uh, deadly encounters, sometimes, you know, soul crushing encounters, you know, dark magics and 
eldritch things, whatever the case case may be, you're naturally going to um, at least be attempted is perhaps the wrong word, but you know there, there's going to if not be an outward change, there's going to be yeah, an internal um, navigation mm -hmm. that's going to determine. Okay, you know, um, I'm understanding who who I am and what my place is in this world, and you know what the world um, even is. And you know, to your to your point, um, line line and dragon it it um, integrates that kind of um, perspective in a very uh, in a very illustrative way, even when it's not necessarily explicit there's not pages and pages and chapters yeah uh in the lion and dragon book talking about it but it very artfully and evocatively weaves it into the world and to what characters are going to exist in this world yeah but when and... you do you do that that's that's the rune quest does this excellently um you know um and dragon even something like Star Wars and Star, mm -hmm. you know, the light side versus the dark side, which is a very, you know, I would say, you know, juvenile and kind of watered down. At least it's a very strong, you know, the light side, dark side has a very strong resonance throughout yeah. that that world. Yeah, and like in in Lion and Dragon as well, it's it makes monsters more interesting as well because. Yeah. You know, you only play humans in that game, and I think that's honestly the way that I prefer to play fantasy now is the characters are mm -hmm. all humans. Um, because you're basically, most of the time in these other games, it's just a costume. Like, there's not yeah, there's not <clears throat> truly fundamental differences between them. Even, like, within the Ring of Fire, like, yeah, like, each race has its own, or species, rather, has its own sort of orientation and, like, you know, Sometimes they eat each other and uh, and, yeah, and all a lot these of things. times they eat each other. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. But you're still, I mean, fundamentally, like, you're not playing a character who is totally alien. You know, they are. You're embodying yeah. different, maybe, or perhaps emphasizing certain aspects of mm -hmm. humanity. But you're never like you can't play something that's totally alien. You know, that is totally outside the human right. experience. Because we don't have access to that, all right. we have is And you is, can't is even humanity. approach it without a lot of work. I, I yeah. I think I'm. I, I'm I'm starting to come around to that um, that mindset as well. I think if you're making a world or if you're creating a game, you should if you're having non-human species, races, whatever. Um, you. You should really have a, a strong identity of what that is, mm -hmm. very strong advice for how to portray that, and a very strong creative reason yeah. to include them. And and the reason I that I'm really enjoying like, you know, all of the monsters that are in Lion and Dragon, because you know, they're 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 fundamentally they're just folklore from, you know, the period right. in England. Yeah, you know, like elves and goblins and ogres and dragons and all of these things but they they are representative of the hostile the alien like the non-human is dangerous yeah. and uh it's part of the morality it's part of the order right. versus chaos these th these are things of chaos these are right. non-human things yeah these are things that are that are against civilization against you know the the yeah. flourishing of uh, a healthy humanity they're about tearing away that that fabric and uh that's a right. much more interesting game to play in in my opinion um than being able to play you know 50 different species and again like i'm not totally against that it's just i find that less interesting than i used to like i don't care i don't need to play an elf you know i'm i can right, play a really right. interesting human <laughs> you know um right and the things th Things that tend to be, especially in a D and D milieu, that are interesting about dwarf or an elf or a gnome, or what you know, or whatever. Um, it's the different like culture, the elven forest nation, or mm -hmm. the dwarven mountain hold culture. 
you can incorporate a similar culture or a, a feel of a particular culture with human mm -hmm. nation, you know, um, you know, it, it, it really is like, like you said, um, at least most of the time, um, just putting on a, a different mask, a different costume yeah, um, and playing Mo a, a, a human with slightly different, with pointy some ways, in some cases, yeah. arbitrary, you know, um, emphasis on certain right. things. And, and the thing is, it's like when it is done well, because even in Tolkien, it's, it's done well, like the elves, they are different. They have a different perspective yes. because they live a long time and, you know, like, mm -hmm. they, or possibly forever. <laughs> um, right. There's like very hard to play. Right. I possibly impossible, like actually play even um, Legolas, but it's like Elrond or Arwen or yeah. Galadriel. Galadriel, like, yeah. How are you going to role play that? You you can't. You no. can't. Um, and to try and do so, honestly, would um, I don't, even if you're you know, a Tolkien scholar or whatever mm -hmm. even that means. But uh, you yeah. know, it's part part of the the actual identity of a, a lot of these these different races, yeah, you know, the elves especially, um, is the mystery. To try and yeah. inhabit them is to make them less elvish. Yeah, and you know make, I mean? and yeah, they become less interesting. You spoil literally the magic about them, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so again, I'm not gonna like not play games that have non-human choices for, for race sure. of course and i probably will still play non-humans at some point if i find you know an interesting idea or whatever but just from a kind of um the perspective of like what i would consider better writing and better world building uh you like humans are more than enough like more than enough mm -hmm. for all of this and i really like the idea of the non-human being the antisocial and like Right. the this this driving force of entropy and eating away at at everything that has been built um and i know that's what i mean most monsters were you know portrayed that way in early of editions of D D, and you know it's, it is that's the themes of pulp you know is the you know <laughs> the yep. the beast men and uh and all, and all of this um and that's the folk the folklore inspiration you know, right elves are monsters they may be yeah. They're fairies. Mis they're, you know, yeah. fairy, mischievous or even occasionally um, uh, benevolent or um, helpful in some way. But ultimately speaking, and to you know, bring it back around to alignment, the you know, alignment, morality, it's a human. Yeah, it's incompatible. Morality. It's incompatible whatever, with human, human beings. Yeah, whatever morality the creatures of the Fae have, it's... It's either incomprehensible yeah. to human understanding, or it's like inimical to right, like cruel, human flourishing. twisted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, I agree with that. And so, in I kind of think that alignment then, in in terms of like, if you want it to be good in a game, really good, you want the you know you want that woven into the fabric of the game, uh, your alignment system, and. I think ultimately it is a tool of uh, role play. Essentially, it's it's a guidepost yes. for how to role play, and it should enhance your role play. Um, and that doesn't mean it's a straight jacket for your role play. Um, but even these these games that have the kind of alternatives to alignment that they're they're still basically doing the same thing. Um, and when it's done well, it can really enhance your role play and make it better. Um, a couple of different examples uh, that we've been talking about. Um, Miguel from the Red Room recently, uh, their their wretched role playing game, which of course I have right here, uh, and you should check them out if you're watching this episode. This is a uh, game I can't wait to play. Actually, it sounds like an enormous amount of fun. Um, <laughs> the more I get into it, uh, but in their core core rule book right now, since it is uh, the wretched verse is you know, based on anti-heroes, uh, you select, instead of having an alignment, you select one of your, the seven deadly sins. And this is kind of, um, it, get, it incentivizes you to lean into that sin every once in a while, because it will, uh, 
give you basically mechanical bonuses for certain things. And it may also set you back uh, in terms of right. story and whatnot. Um, they recently, though, I think they did an update where they're doing, uh, you can choose a virtue and a vice. So you're not just limited right. to yeah. only playing, you know, the grimy, you know, getting your <laughs> right. down in the filth. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's uh, the idea of having like a boon and a bane associated with it. So when you do this and you lean into the these scenes, it's like you have the possibility of getting a bonus, but there's also the uh, the possibility of something negative happening as a result of it. Um, and this is to kind of this is to enhance the flavor of the game and to enhance your role play and incentivize you as a player to actually mm -hmm. get in there and play your character and do something interesting. Um, with regards to like other games like uh, Vampire, uh, Vampire the Requiem, which I I've been going through a little bit of that again. Like I uh, went to go and reread the Humanity System, and I started reading that book again for like an hour today because it's so good. That is a game where yeah. basically every single mechanic is there to enhance your role play. Um, but the Humanity System in uh, Vampire the Masquerade, I never liked it. It was basically just yeah, a list of like sins that you would, you know, like you're, it, it's supposed to represent uh, how deeply you have fallen and how detached you are from being uh, not. Well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself by saying detached, but like how much more bestial you are becoming. You're becoming less of a man, less of a human being. And again, going into something that is alien, animal, chaotic. Yes. And destruct ultimately totally destructive. That is the base of the game in Vampire is that you have your higher consciousness, but d within the very fabric of your being and your soul is essentially this demonic beast like hunger, this animal that is always waiting to take mm -hmm. the reins away from you and yes. just create bloody murder and chaos. Um, so again, it's not getting, it's not even really getting rid of law and chaos in that sense. You know, they're not doing no. away with alignment. Um, but the, the system in, in Masquerade, I, I did not like it because it didn't really represent anything other than you're being bad. You know, it's like, uh, you know, yeah. you, you have a low human, <laughs> you'd have like a low, uh, a, a three dots in humanity or whatever. And it's like, oh, yeah. you committed premeditated murder. You have to roll for humanity again. You might lose a dot of humanity right. here. And I'm like, <clears throat> you guys realize that there are human beings. You're a vampire. Well, I know. Yeah. For, but before we even touch the vampire part of it, in the real world, there, there are, are people, people who, who commit yeah. <laughs> premeditated murder. murder and, and like, and yeah. way worse. Like, way worse. Yeah. And they're not, like, literal physical they're demons. Still... <laughs> and they're still just right. people. <laughs> you yeah. know, like. It was very much a, a milk toast sort of. You know, I, I would say fairly Disney um, interpretation of like, you know, it's like it, it's not as bad as like Hallmark, you know, definition of good, but it's not not much better. It wasn't until Paths of Enlightenment. Yes. Came out in in uh, later on in Masquerade. Mm -hmm. That's something in that world, I think, makes a lot more sense. It's a Way lot more, more engaging. Uh, yeah, because. Because they're literal they philosophies. Yeah. Right. They're philosophies. They're different ethical codes. Right. Um, and there is a curse, right? Exactly. No one understands really how to deal with this. It's an unnatural phenomenon that's it, been put upon you. And if you and if you don't have some sort of orientation that allows your psyche to be somewhat compatible with the idea that you're a bloodthirsty right. literally a bloodthirsty monster. Like yeah. you would, you would go crazy. You'll become a monster. Like you will a, just, an animal. yeah, you will become the, yeah. that animal. And so it makes sense that you would have these paths of enlightenment. They were alternatives to humanity and the system. Like you basically, you no longer yeah. tracked humanity. You tracked your adherence to the path and the path writing. Yeah. Each, each path had a different, um, a totally different set of like sins and things that you were, uh, you know, ideas that you had to follow. But these were, again, yeah. these were also like templates for then, how you role play it's the kind of thing how like, you see the world how, how you, you see the world act and and what you you know it's 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 like people of different religions have mm -hmm. totally different outlooks on on life even if you you know the, the three uh monotheistic religions they may have 
overlap and things in common, but they do view the world very differently and they act right. very differently based on those principles. And the more that you take those principles seriously, the the kind of more serious that divergence is and the more and, and more importantly, the you know, the stronger your actions are in a certain direction. And that's the same thing with yeah. the paths of enlightenment. Um, but when we got to Requiem, uh, at least when Requiem got to second edition, rather. Second edition uh, Requiem. Yeah, because yeah. uh, first edition Requiem had the same humanity system. Uh, it was it yeah. was no different. Um, <laughs> the second edition, though, treats it very differently because the, the they they also had this system of, of virtue and vice in New World of Darkness. And the mechanical side of that, I think, was that if you played out your vice, if you played into it, then you got a single point of willpower back. And then if you uh, played your virtue, which was much more difficult, I think you got three points of willpower back. I think that's right. Yeah, they re they replaced that in Requiem Second Edition with what's called the Mask and the Dirge, and the Mask is basically yes. what you present to the world, and, the, and it says very explicitly, it's and like to humanity, to mortals specifically. Right, right, and it and it says like, look, when you become a vampire, you know instantaneously the very act of being you is mm -hmm. like this grave sin. So the idea that you're going to adhere yes. to these virtues and vices anymore, that's out the window. So you have the the mask, which is how you present yourself to humanity. Uh, this is the lie that you tell to people, essentially. Yeah. Um, when you play into that, you get that single point of willpower back. But if you act in defense of, and, and it's I think it's, it's the strength, with the lengths to which you go to act in favor of your dirge or your mask, uh, mm -hmm. has a yeah. huge uh, difference in the amount of willpower you recover. I think it's like you, if you if you do like commit like horrific acts in protecting your dirge, that you right. get all of your willpower back. Um, but the fact is, you have to commit these horrible acts, and there's all sorts of other consequences that go along with them. Mm -hmm. um, but the humanity system, in particular, uh, was detached from being about. Uh, just these dumb sins that you would commit and and tracking yeah. like, you know, how mean how much of a meanie you're becoming. And it became very <laughs> much more oriented towards um, how how well can you even empathize or relate to humanity anymore? It's really more about right. becoming very much so detached. And you have to do yes. I mean, they even say you have to do detachment roles uh, uh, when you are in these moments of crisis, when you're when your humanity may lower and. As a result, like when your humanity lowers, uh, you can't you you start creeping people out just by your very existence. Mm -hmm. And the Nosferatu are at a much much worse uh, disadvantage in this case because they already kind of wear that on the outside. Um, they're isolated. They look horrific. Right, or they have some just completely creepy, unsettling presence. Um, that was actually one of the great changes from Requiem as well. Is that the Nosferatu did not necessarily have to be physically deformed uh monstrosities right, there's it's just that something yeah something gross deeply uh, deeply creepy them. about them yeah like i had yeah. oh man one of my players came Great up with this change. idea um where uh basically his when he was standing in anyone's peripheral vision every once in a while in their peripheral vision they would see him like reaching very slowly for their for their throat <laughs> and so the, and the second yeah. they looked you know it was like he's just standing there and he just yeah. would forget about this all the time. So I'd throw it in at random times where people would be like, oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> and just like yeah. completely ruined, yeah. <laughs> ruined whatever was going on for them. And he'd be like, fuck. <laughs> um, but he otherwise looked normal. Um, but anyway, getting, getting back to the, the humanity and detachment, uh, it's, it's that you, you become unable to even empathize with human beings after a certain point. And uh, that's a what much more interesting thing to role play and i think there is the the best example of where you could find this like probably in popular media there's this movie called under the skin with um i was about to say natalie portman uh not scott garibay also not the name i'm looking for uh it's the name <laughs> always comes to mind um but with scarlett johansson um and it takes place in scotland and she's an alien and she drives around in a van in scotland trying to seduce random guys off of the street and she brings them back to her house which like down in the basement is this like black void where she draws them out into the black void 
they end up like walking. She's like basically walking backwards on water and they go down into the water and then they get dissolved. And it's like this weird Kubrick montage of what's happening to their, their body and their innards. Um, But her character has, when she's interacting with people, she's able to, to, to fake it completely, you know, like human expressions Mm -hmm. and all of this. But the second she's done with it, it's like, that's gone. It's just like the total blank look. Right. And she eventually tries to start understanding people, and it's really fucked up. Uh, there's this great scene where she's on the beach and she's watching people drown, and like they have a baby on the beach, you know, and she's just sitting there watching it happen. Doesn't help. Eventually, like goes and like grabs the the drowned corpse and like brings it onto the beach and is just kind of staring at it. But it's like to me, that's what the low humanity vampire is. It's not the yes. the raging like. <clears throat> Yeah, fuck you. I'm gonna I go just, tear I everyone apart. Nothing. It's I yeah, I feel I, nothing, and I can't. It doesn't mean anything to me. I'm it, not. A it part doesn't of mean this. anything. Yeah, right. and the the fight and the struggle in in vampire is to avoid becoming that, and that's an interesting mm. game to play and an interesting struggle as a role player to to fight against that. You know that when you when you say that that actually I I didn't even think to bring this uh, game up, but. Um, I have to watch that that movie. I haven't seen it, but it's you'll love it. It's it very really much good. gives me um, ideas and inspiration for another Chronicles of Darkness game, which I love. It's one of my favorites. It's it's uh, definitely my favorite of the unique uh, monster types, yeah. uh, which is Promethean, yeah. Promethean the Created, and the you know, the quote-unquote alignment system, the ethos of that game. You, so in Promethean, you play basically a a Frankenstein monster, a golem of some sort, an mm-hmm. artificially created being that is... Um, something that should not be. Something that should not be. Your very nature not only has part of the you know, quote-unquote curse or, you know, a, a calamity of that type of monster is there's... You have something called disquiet. You are, people can feel, you don't necessarily look, um, you know, the, the, the glamour or whatever. Um, you look normal most of the time to regular people, but there's just something about you. Humans and animals can sense there's something unnatural about you. And more than that, you're disquiet, the, you know, the uh, abomination of, your being the longer you stay in any physic any one physical location you start to physically warp reality around you yeah rain comes down oily uh the soil be- you know uh, buildings begin to erode things start breaking down um but you're trying to you start out the game you're not human you're trying to become human it's sort of like a dark uh pinocchio story mm-hmm. You're trying to become a real mortal human being. And part of, well, really the the whole game is about these characters trying desperately to connect with something that they are not, but so deeply want to be. Yeah. So you you know, I could very much see that uh, being a Promethean character, someone who's early on in their life or their, their existence trying to, understand what you know i don't feel anything when i see these people suffering and fearful for drowning and i don't feel any remorse not remorse but i don't feel any sadness uh for like a dead baby yeah i uh, mean it's it's the frankenstein story i mean that's exp- i think right. pretty much that's one of the explicit inspirations that is one of the sort of that's one of know, the archetype plans or yeah. types yeah yeah um but that's it's very much the the frankenstein it's or like you know it's the evil it would be well, I can't say the evil version of data because that that'd be lore, but so it doesn't quite work lore. there. Yeah, it doesn't quite doesn't quite work there. Um, yeah, but again, it's like it's like we've talked about previously many times on this this uh, podcast and our channel is that these are things that are aspects of the game world that yes. push you into action no matter what. Like there is just something going on in the game all the time because that's the nature 
of the game and the nature of the setting. And when you really do a good job with a system like alignment or a system like humanity uh, or disquiet, all of these these things that that fill that kind of void to orient your character in the world, um, that is like a, a way to have a great role playing experience and a way to spur you into action. Uh, it's yeah. it's a if you neglect these things in designing a game, like you're you're making you're going to make an inferior product. I think like you have to have some something yeah, to orient are. orient you in the world. That's not just I am a fighter or I am mm -hmm. you know the werewolf. You know like there has to be something. And like there. you were saying, it doesn't have to be good evil, right? right? To just you know loop back one more time on vampire, both masquerade and requiem second edition. The paths of enlightenment in VTM and what we've described for uh, Requiem, I, those to me are very good. Requiem is a better implementation, but they're both mm -hmm. very good implementations of a subjective morality. Mm -hmm. There's not, I mean, in Masquerade, I, yeah, you do have, like, God is is real. You do, you do have yeah, and, that. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, in Masquerade, it is basically implicitly assumed that murder is evil and... You, what right. you're doing is evil. The point is you are a monster. It is bad. But given that, you know, yes. then we have this 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 system of morality, essentially, that, that you would have to come up with. Because if you right. are conscious, you have to have some sort of morality. Otherwise, you are an animal right. and a psychopath. Yeah, and it can be. You know, I... I my current conceptualization of, of this, you, you, you can have an objective subjective um um you could have kind of like a a, a gimmick you know, not in a you know i don't mean that as a uh, in a um you know negative connotation a, a kind of a gimmick or a genre yeah based. no i know exactly what you're um, saying like like lion and dragon has very much an objective yeah alignment morality system and dragon has a very objective it's a Christian ethos in in mm -hmm. both of those. The Line of Dragon doesn't use those terms, but uh, it's very much the case. Even though Line of Dragon is leaning more towards the old D and D mechanical conceptualization of mm -hmm. alignment, and Dragon it's more split out and um, elaborate in that you have uh, you know mutually exclusive values in terms of uh, your uh, the cardinal virtues and the deadly sins mm -hmm. you know, lust versus chastity um i don't uh like uh, courage or uh, gluttony versus temperance something. or yeah. gluttony versus temperance something versus versus wrath but but yeah ultimately speaking that's an an objective morality you know uh rec you know we uh, requiem um uh, certainly you'd, certainly you'd requiem. like 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 soy versus eggs you know, the ultimate. <laughs> yes. There you go. Yeah. That's that's an that's you an idea. Slunk for... the soylent, or do you slunk the eggs? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, RuneQuest is also, I would argue, an ob uh, a great uh, uh, implementation of a subjective morality, um, because while there is a kind of overarching theme in that world, uh, that uh, that. Chaos is is bad. Chaos is very much amped up. Um, it's very much explicitly a physically and metaphysically eroding force. Mm -hmm. But you have different... Rune Quest is a very sort of mythologically inspired kind of Bronze Age, uh, Bronze Age setting. But you have different you know, uh, uh, affinities or loyalties to different uh, gods or pantheons of gods, you know, to the ethos, the very fabric of of your being, and it's much more explicitly the case that what you believe is sort of what's physically real. Mm -hmm. In some case, in that world, to worship and to follow Orlanth, the storm god, there are things which are mutually exclusive to following Yelm, the sun god, or Ornalda, um, and the earth pantheon, or you know. There, it's very strongly 
uh, you have this kind of runic morality. Uh, and nominally, everyone sort of despises chaos, but outside mm -hmm. of that larger, you know, annihilating threat, you know, what's what's sort of good and evil, right and wrong, what are the principles which guide you um, can differ you know, very, very much. Yeah. Um, uh, you you mentioned wretched, uh, the wretched the wretched verse, you know, leaning into kind of a, a particular um, virtue or a particular sin, um, sort of yeah, that to me strikes me as very much like a Gonzo thing, a, a, a more of what I would I would say sort of a, a gimmick kind of alignment. I'm choosing, I'm choosing an evocative thematic. Um, point of focus and i'm sort of revving the gas yeah to lean into that thing right i'm gonna it's, be it's about it's about you know, uh what is the morality within the genre that you're playing in whether it's yes you know exploitation films or uh yeah yeah you know or you know like 80s uh I don't want to bring up a different setting we might we might make uh, at some point, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that bit, yeah, sure. <laughs> don't want to get too far in there. Um, or like, you know, the kind of dark superhero, antihero stuff like The Crow, you know, or like, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, and, or Payback, which is like such <laughs> a good movie. We're going to have to watch that when you get, when you get here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like these, you know, characters who have, a code of some kind, but are they fall outside of the kind of traditional conception of good and evil? They may still end up yeah. saving the day, uh, not to pull a line directly from the wretched role playing book, um, but uh -huh. you know they might hurt people to do it. <laughs> you sure, know. and you know all of these things, like these are very different ways of doing of of implementing sort of a quote unquote alignment system mechanically. Yeah. Um, and you know, the very thematics of these alignments or moralities are in some cases like, again, totally in opposition with each other, you know, depending on, on the game and the yeah. world, but all of this, you know, like we said at the beginning, these aren't, you know, prison bars that are, you know, or a straight jacket that's no, you know, keeping you confined. This is fuel. Yeah. This is fuel. This for is going to make your game body better. Of character. Yeah, it's going to make your, your game way better. Is passionate about or right or you know how he sees the world. Um, you know, this is fuel for that fire. So you know, don't sleep on this. Uh, this you know, a kind of an alignment system or an align an awareness of alignment, just because it's done extremely poorly yeah in D and d has been for a very a very long time because yes alignment in dungeons and dragons is terrible because, because they don't do anything yeah they, have, yeah they don't do know, anything they don't do with anything. it yeah like there's yes. no like um i mean at least you know over the course i can't speak to fifth edition again because i haven't i haven't really gone through much of their stuff um but for a very long time alignment essentially was meaningless it didn't have it wasn't tied to anything really of value outside of like oh you can't be a paladin now you know yeah. or oh like this particular magical item you can't use it because if you're you're a di you're of a different alignment and it's like that's the extent of the world building or the way in which it's it's integrated into the game but the concept of alignment is good it is a good yes. like in terms of like good game design and good world building you the don't want to just jettison that um because it w your game will suffer and it will suffer in the same ways that these shitty games suffer because that that's one of the you know foundational issues that they've they've overlooked and right. if you and if you yeah. do take it seriously and you find a game that takes it seriously especially if it takes it seriously in like multiple aspects like uh yes i just want to keep talking about vampire for like 10 hours but uh yeah. but in requiem it's also it's not like you have the humanity system which is like the core explicit part of your character but you also do have essentially like the factions you align with all have different ideologies that fit within this yes and they are very much like law or chaos oriented in a sense mm -hmm. like you have mm -hmm. like the carthians who are basically like these like more 19th century style like commie like commie anarchists 
like bomb throwing yeah. anarchists, not the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the weaklings that we have today. Um, <laughs> and you have like the Lenkea at Sanctum, which is like a, a really creepy version of the Catholic church. Catholic uh, church, you vampiric Catholic yeah, church. The Invictus, which is like, like the state and like society, you yeah. know? Um, and then you have like the circle of the crone, which is the abdication mm-hmm. of all of that and embracing the monstrosity. And, yeah. uh, like and pagan morality, a right. dark, like an e, a dark pagan morality, right? And the the Ordo Dracul, which is like the, they're trying to overcome and transcend the curse, and this is very much like right. an individualist, like against the, the order, you know? Like it's yeah. it's really like really interesting stuff. And if you have those that are uh, in conflict with your character, um, it's I mean it just makes for such good role play and like. Right. That's the thing about these there these games. Like, I was when I was looking through Blood and Smoke again. Like, I got to read this whole book. I'm going to do an entire review on it because it's like every mechanic in that book is tied into your role play and making and like and it, it's not just like oh here's yeah. how to play your character better. It's that it's like this is how you play the game. And if you play the game, you know, yeah. roughly according to the rules, you're gonna be role playing the whole time. And it's going to be and this awesome. Is, this is how all these different things fit into the larger fabric of the world. Of the and world, yeah. The character in that world. And I love that. You're not divorced from the setting at all. There's very great... Um, the, the writing is evocative. It's easy to understand. And, yeah. um, you know, mechanically speaking, like every, you know, everything is accounted for and all the you know all the weights and the levers mm-hmm. it, it all makes sense yeah how this all works the gears turn um, you know and it's very they turn very smoothly in that game yeah um and it's it's just what a great game and what an overlooked gem that is because people are yeah. fucking idiots and they hate on requiem so world much world of darkness uh yeah world of darkness players and Fans are the worst type of a worst type yeah, of fandom. Yeah, just a terrible fandom. Terrible I hate fandom. It. These, I hate oh it. my, I hate it too. It drives me crazy. I, and I like, I like VTM. I do too. Um, I love it. I yeah, and I have like, all the nostalgia for it. I have all of that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, but like, like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, about, seriously, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Like people, because yeah. people will tell me like, oh yeah, Requiem is, is terrible. Uh, it's just a ripoff of Masquerade. I'm like, you've never read it then. I'm like, you've yeah, literally yep. never read the fucking book. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you have literally proven Terrible. to me that you've never picked up the book. <laughs> yep. Oh my God. Um, I just want to loop back to, you know, our uh, righteous indignation about uh, Watsi and the mm-hmm. current state of things. Um, if you want to try and bring this to life, bring alignment system to, to life in like a D&D Pathfinder-esque game, um, I would strongly recommend people set uh, set their next game in the Dragonlance campaign setting. Because that setting to me, more than any other, more than, way much more than the Forgotten, the Forgotten Realms or Planescape, Ravenloft, um, the world is built in such a way that it has a very clearly understandable built-in alignment framework. It's a moral framework based off of the D and D alignment system. Mm-hmm. Good, neutral, um, good, neutral, evil. Everything feeds feeds uh, down into that sort of three, you know, uh, three-way um, organizational structure from the gods. It's very explicitly, it's the pantheon of good, the pantheon of evil, the pantheon of neutrality. And they have the same number of deities in them, I think, mm-hmm. changed with Age of Mortals, but but regardless. Um, there's three different um, major organizations of arcane magic. Wizards of the White Robes, the Red Robes, and the Black Robes. There's three martial orders that, you know play this same right. chorus of sort of thematic morality. You have the Knights of Salamnia, you have the Legion of Steel, and you have the Dark Knights or the Knights of Naraka. Everything from top to bottom 
is organized. The world spins based off of this, uh, yeah, your D and D nine portion alignment system. You know, lawful good to chaotic evil and and sort of every everything in between. So that's a world which is the 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 fluff, for lack of a better word. The 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 setting itself is structured in such a way as to make standard D and D alignment system actually really come to life in a yeah. in a really cool way. Um, it's just again, Watsi has not well, and if they're taken the creative endeavor to to really integrate this. Yeah, and if they are, and if they're if they're eliminating alignment, they're they're ripping the heart and soul out of that game. You can't you can't run. You can't portray an accurate um, presentation of the Dragonlance setting or Kryn without having alignment be a crucial part of the understanding from the GM's perspective and from the player's perspective, for the character's perspective. Yeah. You know, it's it's built into the fabric of that world. Um, and it's just going to be... I know they've, they've released stuff for Dragonlance in 5th edition. I haven't read it, but I have zero faith that it's not a complete bastardization and a a betrayal yeah they of, uh, they of that, like, of that world like we've said what they're doing with these products is they're taking them out back to the pet cemetery and burying <laughs> them in the indian burial ground and yep. they're coming back to life and when they come back they're not the thing you remembered they're not the yeah. thing you remember no. <laughs> they are hostile <laughs> they are agents of chaos yes. yeah it's uh yeah i think this was it's funny because when we um I hadn't really thought explicitly about alignment uh, until mm. very recently because we we've been trying to record this episode for uh, kind of quite a while a now, a couple um, weeks, yeah, a couple weeks, and it just kept getting pushed back for for whatever reason. And I remember when you brought up the topic, you were like, "I want to talk about alignment," and I think that was around the time that like you also it's like you're not on Twitter all that much, but like every time that one of these topics is coming up on Twitter, yeah. you're like simultaneously like thinking of it, like psychically pulling <laughs> in. Cause you're like, you know, I was thinking about reaction roles or I was thinking about, you know, like, like yeah, yeah, these yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you're like, I want to talk about alignment. And I was like, I don't think I really have any strong feelings on it because my entire experience with alignment in D and D and Pathfinder and all this stuff in the previous days of my gaming was kind of like, uh, it was just there. Like, I don't really, need it. It's, yeah. it's a relic. It's just, you know, I can role play my, my yeah, character. Exactly. And, I know, know how to role play in, in all this, but then like right. it's actually sitting down, thinking about it, doing some reading, watching some people's videos on this stuff. I was kind of like, no, like alignment actually is incredibly important. And even if you're not calling it alignment, uh, right whatever alternative that you're having in place for it, they are accomplishing the same thing. And yes. it's, if you don't have it, your game is going to suck. And mm -hmm. if you do have it and you're making a game, you want it to integrate fully with pretty much everything about the world. Because when you do that, it, the, the game sings. It's uh yes. Yeah. yeah, very much so. So you heard it from black lodge games. We love alignment. <laughs> that's right. Take it to the bank. Yeah. Well, I think that's right. pretty much. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up on time right now. That was a. Uh, yeah. Pretty much. Uh, it was good that timed. things uh, things delayed. It gave us both time. Yeah, it gave us more time this. to think about it, which is uh, which is good. And uh, just more more proof to the conviction and the reality that we are on a mission from God, and right. He is organizing things. Uh, us to share right. this uh, this uh, this conviction to you exactly, and uh, <laughs> oh, and an update on the mission from God. Um, if you guys have made it this far in the video, I would really hope check the description, go find the link. Uh, we're gonna link this guy's channel. His name is C Four Crispy. Uh, great dude, making some great really channel. yeah, great channel. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, you know watched our channel and Shauner and uh, some others other, that are other people yeah, kind of in this mm -hmm. this immersive role play space. Um, and, you know, took some of the kind of game building advice that we've given and has been bringing it to his table. And it sounds like he's having great success at it, which is yeah, which awesome. Is, 
Awesome. Um, yeah. That, so cool to hear. That makes us feel amazing because we were also yeah. anticipating the possibility that it would just ruin your social life right. <laughs> and Which destroy we're, your no, friendships. We're still, we are very much okay with Yeah, we're still okay um, with but... that. So if you're out there and you take our advice and it goes horribly wrong, we're okay with that yeah. too. Yeah. But yeah. please his, go his check his out his channel. His channel is a... Is a... You know, a, a, a big white pill in a sea of black. Exactly. Big, big white yeah. pill. Guy who's had a lot of experience running games for decades and is, you know, pushing, not pushing, but, you know, uh, bringing his players he's, into it. He's a, bringing a, it up. Yeah, he's bringing it up and saying like, hey, guys, do you guys want to try, you know, actually doing a little bit more role play? And they're and responding well to it. some of his players he's been playing yeah. with like a long time. long time some of them are first time playing any yeah. type of game so it just goes to show whether you've been with a group for decades or you have people who've never engaged with the hobby um you know you have no excuse not to be yeah. bringing this this quality gold that we're right bringing. exactly exactly but it makes yeah it makes us very happy that uh someone's table is ostensibly yeah. having a better time because of our content um so with that uh Remember to like, subscribe, comment, share this video, do all that stuff, and stay tuned for our Thursday night uh, live streams. Uh, mm -hmm. We got more videos coming up and more shorts coming up. Uh, so we're actually working on content that is not specifically just the podcast. And so we yes. got a lot in the works. Um, so and this uh, Saturday we have uh, oh, that's episode right. two of our cyberpunk uh, game, Blood exactly. and Sunshine. Blood episode and Sunshine, two. episode two. Can't wait. I am so mm -hmm. pumped. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. All right. I think that about wraps it up. So just remember. No apologies. No, no compromises. compromises. I almost screwed it up, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs>